Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Felicity. Can you Good hear morning. me though? Good morning, Andy. Good morning.
Um, Morena, and welcome to our last infrastructure committee meeting for the triennium. I welcome you and I welcome our elected members and our staff online here today. Uh, we have one item that will be uh, debated in PX and we'll move into that shortly. And then we have uh, further information reports and staff to speak to those items. Uh, we'll start our hui today with a karakia. Uh, and um, I can do that now, so ino tato. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te taonga, ki a makinekina, ki uta, ki a, ki a mataratara, ki tai. E hi aki ana, te atakura. E tio, he hoka, he hau e hu, tihe mauri ora. Uh, I can see online here we have our staff, uh, Tanya Proctor, thank you, and uh, we have our declarations and uh, apologies. Do we have any apologies here noted, uh, Rhonda? I think there must be a councillor court. Yep, so we've received apologies from Deputy Mayor Court and I don't see and his worship, worship the mayor. mayor as well. So I'm happy to move. Uh, do we have seconder? Thank you, Councillor Smith. Oh. Uh, I don't think we need to do this by division, this one item. Uh, all in favour, please signal if you're not in favour. All in favour. Uh, aye, so we'll, we've got that carried. I don't see anyone signalling they're not in favour of. Sorry about that, I just lost connectivity. Can you hear me? All good, so let's see. Yep. Can I can see someone moving up. Can you hear me? I just lost connectivity there, I think. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? No. We can hear you, Felicity. Can you not hear us? Yeah, no, it sort of froze just then. Sorry, oh. Alhamai. Um, I can hear you now, Kelly. Um, so we'll now move on, uh, we, as we have no deputations, uh, we'll confirm the previous minutes and then move into um, the public um, exclusion. So uh, oh, the minutes Chair, there, item. Would it be okay to have um, Marnie introduce himself? Mm. Oh, Aruhai Mai, yes. Um, he's also, um, we've also had a prior meeting. Uh, Mane, we can't see him though, so that might be... <laughs> A technicality, but we can hear you, uh, Mane. Are you there? Aye. Oh, yeah, cool. Um, yeah, well, Kapoi, um, Tene to Mihikia Kato Kato, uh, Tene Taku Hui Tuorua, uh, Kamama Te Koriro, uh, Mane Tahiri Tene, uh, He Uri no Napuhi, um, uh, I Mihikawa Kiana, Hikaka Tene Niho, um, so. Just a, a second hui, short introduction, Mani Tahiri. Um, hail from Kaikohe. Kia ora. Kia ora, Mani. And yes, second meeting, so um, I hope it's all going well for you. Uh, it's great to have you on board. Uh, and uh, we can now move on to uh, the previous minute, so item four. Um, I'm happy to move that. Uh, is there a seconder? Yes, I'll second that of yeah. Adele. Thank you, Adele. Uh, your camera is off, Adele. We can't see you. But, no, um, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm unable to get the camera going. Not a problem. So we've had that moved and seconded, uh, and we'll bring that up for, uh, for a vote by division. Are there any matters that anyone li would like to raise? No, great. Okay, I'm in favour. In favour. Councillor Collard, uh, Councillor Smith. Support. Uh, mm. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Busich. Aye. <laughs> you hear me now? Uh, it, I can hear you now. Uh, Member Gardner. Aye. 
in Mimda Tahiri. Tautoko. Great. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that brings us to uh, our moving into public, public exclusion. Uh, I'm happy to move to uh, transition to public exclusion. Is there a seconder? Happy to second. No second. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear that. Uh, just lost connectivity. Is there a seconder? Councillor Smith, second. Uh, an abundance uh, of seconders. <laughs> great. Uh, so I'm in favour. Councillor Collard. In favour. Councillor Smith. Support. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Vucic. Aye. Member Gardner. Aye. Um, member Tahiri. Tautoko. Thank you, and we'll just await.
Uh, thank you. And we are back now for our, our public information reports. And I welcome uh, the NTA today uh, to our meeting. And uh, a lot of the items that we have uh, today are very relevant to our infrastructure that uh, we utilise uh, every single day. And we are dependent on uh, for not only our day to day lives, but our uh, connections to the rest of the country and the markets uh, extended out from that. Uh, our first item is item 5.1, roading and maintenance obligations um, for our contracts, our roading happy contracts. To, happy to move. Oh, and we have a mover already, so that's uh, Councillor Gusset. And Councillor Stratford uh, has seconded that there, um, so that's item 5.1. And I can see that we have Calvin online and we have Bernard online. And of course we have uh, Andy there. Um, Andy, would you like to speak to this or should we go straight to the NTA star? Um, through the chair, I think it's probably appropriate that uh, we invite Calvin and, and Bernard to uh, um, present the paper and uh, then take questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Maureen, everyone. Um, just, I guess, uh, from a process perspective, within the paper, there is also a presentation. Um, just wanted to check uh, with you, Chair, whether you wanted to run through, Bernard, to run through the presentation or whether you just, um, I'm getting thumbs up. You got lots, you got lots of from noise, yeah. members. Yep, cool. Um, so we'll, we'll run through that presentation um, and have questions to follow. And then um, just on top of that, knowing um, the recent events of July and August storms, um, for um, committee member reference, Bernard's also got four or five slides um, to run through just to give some um, context and appreciation of some of the damage and, and actions we're taking out on the network that would likely be of interest to the committee um, as well. So I'll hand over to Bernard. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, oh, there's a few slides in this pack, uh, so I'll try and get through them reasonably uh, promptly. Um, just a question, if I may, Rhonda, would you prefer uh, me to share my screen and work through the slides, or are you happy for me to? That's fine, you can share, Bernard. Thank you. Thank you, Dick. Bear with me while I pull this up. That's your calendar, Bernard. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Just taking it still. <laughs> I hope you can see that now. Yeah, yeah okay. Fantastic. All right. So today I'm going to take you through the existing uh, contract maintenance obligations, uh, particularly focused on the unsealed roading network, uh, which has been a highlight of, uh, of a few of our interests uh, lately with the recent uh, weather events in particular. Um, a bit of background first. So the road maintenance renewals contracts, these uh, commenced in July 2018, uh, were adopted by the uh, by the councils. Uh, it was developed through the NTA uh, as an integrated uh, one network approach. Um, so we've, we've got one contract model across uh, all three district councils. Uh, it introduced for the first time an inspection-led approach to the identification uh, and programming of, of network needs. Um, levels of service were set based on road hierarchy. It was the very uh, uh, early days of, of the rollout of the ONRC um, and the levels of service uh, were designed to um, address the one network road classification um, expectations. Uh, we're currently at the beginning of separable portion two, which extends the contract through to June 2024. Uh, just a brief uh, touch on the worker management process. Um, there is a single fundamental process that underpins these contracts, uh, but within that we have three uh, main work types. Uh, one of those being the routine work, uh, which is mostly made up of lump sum activities uh, where the contractors are paid a lump sum per month to undertake uh, the physical work. Uh, ordered work, which, defy, which is uh, work that requires 
uh, approval by the engineer and is presented to us in a in a monthly uh, program. And then we have our cyclic work activities as well. So cyclic work activities, uh, their preset timing um, throughout the year includes our uh, our sump cleaning, channel sweeping, line marking, uh, those sort of annual uh, housekeeping uh, activities. Uh, the current inspection process, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, was relatively new uh, or was new introduced into these contracts, um, having uh, the identification of work um, identified through an inspection process. Um, <clears throat> uh, through this process, all routine work and ordered works are identified. Um, for programmed works, they're prioritised. Um, given a priority rating, priority one through to three, um, and the routine work, as soon as that is uh, entered into the system, it starts to trigger our, our response time process. The unsealed inspection, so the, uh, the process for that, um, or rather the, um, the items identified, it's it's all pavement defects we're looking at. It's a it's a boundary to boundary, fence line to fence line, if you like. Um, it includes signs, structures, vegetation control, uh, traffic facility features, so your railings, uh, barriers, edge markers, um, and of course your drainage assets and culverts. Um, now the drainage assets, it is a best effort approach through the unsealed inspection process. Um, so we we expectation our expectation is that uh, if you can see an issue from the driver's seat um, or signs of an issue, um, they need to be identified and recorded through that unse unsealed inspection process. Now the reason for that is we also have a drainage inspection process, uh, which requires the contractors to identify and review any defects on every single drainage asset we have in our database on an annual basis. The unsealed inspection uh, process, uh, what we've got is a, a, a set frequency for inspections. I'll just jump back a slide, sorry. If you ever look at the table to the right frequency of inspections, um, we went through a process to align our, our inspection uh, frequencies with the ONRC rollout. Um, so through that process, uh, we identified roads that were uh, either high, medium or low uh, from a risk perspective. And then we also grouped them by the, the road uh, ONRC rating as well. Um, jumping to the next slide, what that meant was 69% of our network ended up on a uh, once per month uh, inspection cycle with 31% sitting at uh, a two monthly. Uh, we do have scope within the contract to review this um, and even stretch some of those inspections out. However, um, with the with the demand and what we see as far as our network um, deterioration mode, uh, we have found that the two month and one month inspections are, are reasonably comfortable for our unsealed network. A couple of examples there of, of uh, what a uh, once per month uh, unsealed inspection um, site would be. We've got Parapara Road on there, Henderson Bay Road, Kohumaru, uh, Rafati Road, and West Coast Road as examples of that. That uh, 69% uh, for the two monthly. We've got Motuti, Orida, uh, Waiotehui, and uh, Kai Mau Mau uh, Road in that sort of catchment. So the unsealed inspections, when we look at the routine items we expect to be identified through that, um, I've listed uh, straight from the contract there, a bit of a table around that one. Um, as mentioned earlier, you'll see drainage assets there, it's a best effort approach, um, but we also require signs, traffic traffic's facility items, unsealed pavement, vegetation control and structure item, items to be identified. A couple of photos over to the right uh, as examples of of those defects. And as those uh, as those defects are identified, we also have a, a routine response time uh, trigger sitting in the background. Um, so if I use the example there of an unsealed pothole, 
uh, upon identification through those inspections uh, on any arterial roads, they have one week response time uh, to complete those. Now, most of our roads sit within the primary collector to low volume uh, range um, arterial roads. We're getting up there almost uh, almost a state highway, which uh, uh, our unsealed roads don't uh, don't fall into that category. Um, you'll also see to the far right, we also have uh, triggers around the safety aspects of those items as well. So the example to the right there, uh, that would be what I would deem an unsafe um, cluster of potholes, uh, which would trigger an unsafe response uh, to the pothole uh, being identified, which then shortens up that response time to one week. Uh, the example given to the right there, you can clearly see the vehicle tracks uh, movement from the public heading out around those potholes on a blind corner. So those are the kind of considerations that need to de be taken into a place, uh, taken into place when when determining that uh, that response time. Unsealed inspections also, as I mentioned before, include the ordered work activities. Um, a few examples there of of what those ordered works are. So we've got. Um, our unsealed payment uh, activities outside of your your routine grading. So these are the wet grade roll, uh, which requires water cart and roller. Um, these are your rip and remakes. These are your pavement strengthening type activities that carry uh, a reasonable cost behind them um, and do require an element of design and in consideration to, to uh, uh, appropriate budget management across the network. Um, Ordered work response. Uh, I've thrown this in there just to highlight, we don't really have a uh, direct response time against ordered work activities, but what we do expect is them to be appropriately prioritized. Um, and that includes an urgent uh, priority on those. So most of the activities are entered in as priority one, two, and three. Uh, the expectation, anything within uh, identified as a priority one should be considered for the immediate program. Uh, priority two activities, they are those sorts of activities that um, are, are very uh, at risk of becoming a priority one, uh, need to be given a, a close watchful eye over. Whereas priority three, the sort of defects that are starting to appear, but um, at this stage, we're just going to uh, monitor uh, through the repeat inspection process. Customer requests. So this is to highlight how customer requests are dealt with through the contract um, and those response times associated. So standard requests are received through council. Uh, our expectation is the contractors need to acknowledge those, uh, those requests within a two working day uh, response time frame, and then they've got 10 days to investigate an action. Now, the action of that um, activity, what we mean by action is it's identified into RAM as our database. Um, at that point in time, it then triggers the physical work um, response time. We also have priority request consideration and urgent request consideration in there as well. So a priority request is something that we as a NTA team um, have identified um, or we've received a service request um, and understand the uh, the priority needs of it, uh, we can trigger that three working day uh, response time frame as opposed to the 10 plus two identified above. Equally with the urgent requests, um, anything coming through deemed urgent, uh, the response time shortens right up to um, two hours within the FNDC. You'll notice it was one hour for WDC and KDC. That was simply taking into account uh, the uh, smaller um, geographical spread of the districts um, and the ability for the contractors to physically get to that item uh, within a reasonable time. So taking all that into account, um, these are kind of the uh, worst case scenarios, if you like, um, for um, time frames from identification from a customer to physical work completion. Now you see there the customer driven standard response that can stretch right out to 20 days from identification of a routine item, a pothole, to, to physically completing that pothole. Now, 
that is more relevant to your 31% of the network that is covered by a two monthly inspection. Um, not so applicable to your one monthly, where a one monthly inspection process, you've got a one a monthly reset of the level of service um, for routine items. So the expectation is the you know within that initial 12 day period um, or the preceding 20 days, an inspection has actually already been through that road as well um, and brought forward the uh, the completion you know, or the expected time frame to complete the physical work. Uh, contract audits. So we've got two main uh, audits within the contract. You've got your inspection audits. That's where we physically go out um, as a team and we ensure that the inspections undertaken by the contractors are correct and accurate and they're not missing anything through that process. Uh, we've also got the work audits. So that's where we go out once the work is completed uh, and we ensure it meets our quality um, of workmanship expectations under the contract. Uh, in general, um, these activities, we, we ex expectation is uh, to audit up to 10% of each. Um, we are generally exceeding that um, across the board, um, but built into that, there's an expectation if we start to identify trends out there, we can increase our audits to, to key focus areas. And just to highlight the key performance uh, measures built into the contract, uh, as I mentioned, we are out there auditing um, those two activities. We also have another number of other um, KPMs uh, built into the contract around ensuring those response times are being met, as well as ensuring those customer service um, timeframes, the two day acknowledgement and the 10 day uh, uh, physical entry of, of the dispatcher are met as well. So that was a very quick uh, run through of the unsealed road contract obligations. Um, I'm happy to take questions now if there are any. Uh, thank you, Bernard. And I'll just um, ask if elected members have one question each because I'm just aware <laughs> of, of time and uh, I will be strict on, on standing orders here because not only do you have to ask your question, but then Bernard will have to respond. Uh, so uh, the, the order that we have here is Councillor Stratford followed by Councillor Busage and then Councillor Smith. Councillor Stratford, Can I just note that we've only got a couple items on this agenda and this is probably our only chance to interrogate the um, issues that we are having with our unsealed roads and the number of calls that I'm getting about our unsealed roads, I don't think limiting this to one question is very, what, what are we doing our job for if we can't ask all our questions? I think it's just to give each elected member a chance instead of one elected member having all the questions, uh, Councillor Stratford. So I feel I'll like go last, see, just you. in case others cover them off in their one mm. question then. Thanks. Oh, excellent, thank you. Uh, so is following that, that is Councillor uh, Councillor Busich and then Councillor Smith. Um, I think I got three minutes of speaking. Um, so, so, so I do have a, a actually I have more than one question. One of the things I noted there, and this is the main one I had, is you you didn't mention some of the key things that are causing road failure. You mentioned the water tables and drains. That's fine. And in those pictures that were seen on that page there, in that example in your in, in your um, presentation, uh, the road shape doesn't look like it's actually there either. I'm just wondering, are you actually inspecting the basic structure of the road, the, i.e. the shape uh, or the crown, if you like, whatever you call it, um, and the shoulders correct, and that there is a solid uh, subgrade and enough gravel surface on it? Because without that, um, you just keep coming back. And, and um, Madam Chair, that's my main question, but just one is RAM. We t I take it we have the section, every one of these sections included in RAM, so where there's frequent repairs going on, you can put your finger on it immediately. And that's the question, can you? Okay, did you get through that the chair. Yes, I did, thank you. thank you. Yep, uh, so through the chair. 
the first one relating to the the um, pavement aspects. Uh, the reason that's probably a little bit blurry is is the split between what is routine and what is ordered work. Uh, but yes, um, pavement defects, shape, um, where they're starting to wear through, um, and that uh, pavement thickness, uh, all aspects uh, we we expect to be looked at and considered through that uh, inspection process, and that we audit for as well. Um, so. It really depends on what's being seen out there, whether it actually sits under a routine um, grading response um, or audit work, um, reshape, rip and remake and the likes. Um, so that's why it's probably a little bit blurry there, but yep, they are, I can confirm, they are being identified, those, those aspects. Um, as far as RAM, yes, RAM is a fantastic tool. Uh, the good thing is uh, we do expect where these clusters of potholes and the likes for those to be point located uh, through that inspection process. Uh, whereas historically, a section of road may have been identified um, as, re as requiring the, uh, the physical work. The good thing with the point locating is we can start to have a look at uh, almost like heat mapping um, and identify where those hotspots are on the network um, and refocus our attention to those. Thank you. I hope that answered your questions. It does. <clears throat> Just on mute, Madam Chair. Sorry about that. Uh, so we have Council Collard next. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, my my question is is around the the order of work now. If I have one thing, it's plenty of calls about roads and uh, I endeavoured to pass that on. And and just as an example, um, I got a call this or a, an email this morning, not half an hour before this meeting, in relation to um, a, a road where work has been done three times in the last two months. And I, and I can understand that given the weather patterns that we've had. However, mm -hmm. Part of the problem that they've got, and I'll, I will tell you what the road is, it's Hehe Road out past the um, motor camp. The guy says that, that the um, service people have been out there, they've put more metal, they've had a big digger out there, cleared the slip that came down, and, and all that sort of stuff was done and, and, and spread more metal, which was great. But the whole over the whole two-month period and the three visits by contractors, the uh, culvert was never ever unblocked and it's been blocked the whole time. So it, it is still, as of today, there is a culvert there that is completely blocked with stones and mud and all that sort of stuff that um, is not allowing water to get away. Now, um, there isn't an RFS for this yet. This is only going to come in, but our contractors have been out there working on that road continuously. Why is that something that is not picked up in the audit of the work done, specifically when they've been three times in two months? Well, through the chair, uh, that is extremely disappointing to hear. Um, that's, you know, it is an expectation. Um, uh, it is an expectation for the contractors to be, you know, picking up these things. A, a blocked culvert is not something we would expect to um, to need to instruct them to to undertake, uh, particularly if it sits within the uh, the routine response um, half a half a cube expectation. Um, as far as the auditing process, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're auditing around 10%, um, a little bit over generally, uh, but around 10%. It may well be that we just haven't um, focused that audit um, on the, on the Hickey Road, um, but uh, we do identify these things um, and they are addressed through uh, regular alignment sessions with the contractors where we try and reset those expectations. Disappointing. Mm -hmm. thank, uh, thank you, Bernard. Uh, so following that, uh, Member Tahere and then Member Gardner, followed by um, Councillor Smith. Uh, kia ora through the Chair. Um, I had a question around, uh, it's an engagement, so um, sitting through your presentation, um, I just noticed, and, and actually I'll start off with an example, a quick one. I'm part of a community out here in Te Iringa, Matarawa really, and we have a number of unsealed roads, but there was an instance in, in a recent piece of work, um, and I, I gather, assume it might be a, an ordered piece of work, ordered, 
um, where the contractor breached um, private land, Māori land, and there was actually a rahui placed on that piece of land. Um, it has the potential to, it had the potential to blow up quite fast. Um, but the my question is, uh, in that particular example, and I'm, I, I question where was the engagement with local marae? Um, it wasn't too far around um, away from a, from a, our local marae, and so part of your process um, really is the parameters or provisions in there for engagement. I'm not saying for everywhere in the in the rohe Māori, but at least at the very least uh, around local marae um, or local pa. Um, so the question is really around, um, do, I, I didn't see any engagement process detailed in there through any of the processes detailed. Um, and if not, why not? Kia ora. Um, I'm happy to answer that one through the chair. Um, so that, that example that's been raised, um, we um, followed up with the FNDC's to honour group. Um, because we identified out of that a gap in the wider processes um, with our contractors in terms of um, engagement and appropriate identification of, of sites where that engagement is needed. Um, the NTA uses um, councils, um, iwi liaison and um, staff and tuhono group to help um, with our um, community engagement. And as part of that, we had um, staff from tuhono come along to our July all staff meeting um, to actually give a briefing to all of our staff on the expectations and understandings. Um, so um, that was an extremely regrettable incident, but it has become quite a learning incident for our staff um, in terms of what has historically been deemed as routine and as of right, um, and having a realisation that um, not everything that's routine is actually routine and these considerations do need to be done. Um, it's something that as a transport team with our contractors, we're very aware that um, there's a lot more learning and training and and um, and awareness um, that needs to be out there in terms of some of those sites. Um, and, and that's where we're working closely with um, Patrick and his team on how we can actually improve that through our delivery, um, not just in the far north, but also with the other teams in Whangarei and, and Kaipara as well. Kia ora. Thank you, Calvin. Uh, Member Gardner, followed by uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question is probably just outside this report, but I would like to know from um, the NTA, um, with the gorge now being closed, our second preferred option of travelling south is around the um, western route. So I would like to know, this is a council road, and I would like to know, please, if this road has been assessed um, for bringing up to some sort of standard for emergency services as well as to as to where we are with this road, please. Thank you. Through the chair, um, I can partially answer that, I believe. Um, so from a, a current status perspective, uh, those roads have been um, visually driven over um, and issues identified. We've got our um, our contractors, uh, subcontractor traffic management team out there reassessing those routes at the moment um, to ensure we've got appropriate signage up on even some of the smaller issues that uh, uh, under normal circumstances may not actually uh, qualify for signage, just to make sure we've got good, um, good visibility of any issues out there. I'm also uh, in conversations at the moment with uh, Waka Kotahi around uh, how they can further support us uh, given the impact is as a result of the uh, state highway network closure, um, whether that's a financial um, assistance or or um, offering you know offering up other solutions, um, those conversations are ongoing. Um, as far as reviewing it for a longer term uh, option as alternative to the Mangamokas, I I'm un unfortunate that I cannot respond to that one. Um, 
So I'll I'll just, to you, I'll just, uh, through the chair, I'll just add a little <laughs> bit to the, the longer term. There has been some discussions at the uh, CE and um, senior Wakatahi staff level around um, the need to look at alternate options for the Mangamukas. Um, I know in Steve Mutton's latest update to um, the CEs that um, it has been highlighted as a need within Wakatahi senior management in terms of resilience. Um, so there's a piece of initial exploratory work happening in that space at the moment. Um, unfortunately, it's not something that will address an immediate need um, and the immediate needs are uh, the steps we're taking as Bernard's outlined already. Um, noting that that some of those alternate routes did suffer some significant damage to, during that last alternate storm event. So we are actively encouraging people to use State Highway 10, um, which is the preferred official detour route, obviously, but um, not necessarily the preferred by locals. Thank you. Thank you, Calvin. Um, Councillor Smith and Councillor Stratford, uh, and I also had some questions. Kia ora, Madam Chair, and um, acknowledging Councillor Collard's comments in the response to that, if I was allowed two questions, then I would ask the additional part of why are we only auditing up to 10% of activities completed? But obviously I'm only allowed one, so I'm going to park that seed and let somebody water it. Uh, but my question is around... Um, a, a, I guess the legacy of a band-aid band -aid approach, and when we talk about contract inspections process and the identify, uh, in identification of routine work and maintenance need um, through that, I'm keen to understand how we're considering a whole of network approach to that, especially when it comes to stormwater and culverts, because I'm really mindful that when we clear a bunch of trees, that has an impact further down the stream, or if we clear a drain, that has an impact further down the stream. So in terms of creating our own legacy, I'm keen to understand how we're taking a whole of network approach when we work through that inspections process. Okay, through the chair, um, <clears throat> I guess the most important thing um, is ensuring through our alignment sessions and those inspection processes that the the defects being identified, particularly around the ordered work stuff, the, the items that fall outside of the routine response, are being identified um, and prioritised uh, ac accurately within the system. Um, that is the our, our best way of, of getting a holistic um, idea and understanding of the overall network needs and where to focus attention um, and funding. Uh, that also helps to um, to feed into our, our activity management plan, um, uh, which is our, our submission to Waka Kotahi for funding. So, very, very important uh, aspect there. Um, yeah, through through those um, those alignment sessions, um, we look to refocus our attention um, on proactive maintenance. Uh, there's there's a number of activities such as your routine grading activity, um, which uh, should have an element of of drainage built into it. Um, we're not always seeing. Um, those water tables, easy to easy to um, grade out water tables being undertaken. So there's, there's plenty of ongoing conversations and learning coming out of um, those alignment sessions. Um, a few uh, few months back, I presented on the uh, the rollout of the NTA developed uh, unsealed centre of excellence. Um, so again, that's a a bit of work that's been undertaken by the NTA. Uh, to further set our expectations on what is uh, a suitable proactive maintenance approach to our network um, with a key focus again on, on those drainage aspects. I hope that's answered your question. Um, well, I'll just add to it, through the, through the chair, just add to it slightly um, in terms of the, the whole of network approach um, specifically. Um, that is one of the underlying principles of that centre of excellence um, methodology um, is um, ensuring that all aspects of the road, whether it be the, the underlying base course, the, the running course, the drainage, the crossfall, um, the, even down to shading of the road with overhanging trees and the likes um, to ensure that that area is done. I think the, the part that isn't covered through maintenance is that, expect, uh, that, that understanding that maintenance is funded to maintain a, a road or a section of road to its current state. And as I mentioned at the, um, the um, 
meeting in Kaitaia, we already have an asset condition deficit. Um, and the only way to address that asset um, deficit is through investment, through renewals, rehabs, which aren't part of the maintenance program. This is something that we've highlighted in our AMP um, and we've part of the reason why we've requested extra funding, um, we've got partially of for the centre of excellence upgrade type activities, um, but it is it is a historic legacy issue that as the if the condition of the road is not at the level of service, maintenance in itself will not bring it back. Um, and and as it degrade as you maintain a degraded asset, the degradation actually continues to happen at a faster rate. And that's the bit that we're battling at the moment in terms of prioritising how we address the worst of those first, because they drain on your actual maintenance expenditure. Um, we're seeing, um, we're working through at the moment a, re a report on the increasing numbers of identified defects over the four years of the contract. Um, and I think, as I mentioned at the last council meeting, we don't have the budget to fix all priority two and priority three defects. And as you leave them unaddressed, you start getting further issues across the network. Um, so that's that's part of the the problem we're battling at the moment is a a legacy of of a degraded asset that we're trying to bring back up to speed at eight percent a year at a time at the moment. See, see the chair, can I be um, indulging just adding some more comments to that? I think it's be quite useful. Um, I think there's a couple of things themes in there and, and quite rightly the NTA have commented around the roading aspects. I think your your question, Councillor Smith, was a little bit broader um, around land use planning um, and the and the management of stormwater um, from where it falls to how it um, how it discharges. And that's a sort of wider discussion that's been had in the three waters debate as well um, and the interface um, in terms of where responsibility for stormwater, which we know flows across private land, council land, through road reserve, um, and, and its path out to a, a stream or the sea, um, responsibility and accountability for what the various stages of the flow of water from uh, across the catchment. So it is a conversation that's being had nationally around catchment management and the interface with roading, um, which forms a you know overland over overland flow path and management across the roading network. It hasn't been settled yet. Um, so I would would reflect on uh, particularly the Water Services Bill 1 and potentially Water Services Bill 2, where there'd be a lot more detail, but it's still a national conversation in that space. Um, I think um, with Councillor Court not being present, I'd probably just uh, speak for her in terms of um, the issue around funding and the funding for road maintenance and the funding model, which is clearly nas broken nationally. and. Uh, there will be uh, pressures on the amount of money that's afforded to council to do roading activity and we can clearly see that at the moment and the expectation is that may get um, may get worse in future settlements so um, the issue there is around how how that gets funded and and should you have been allowed to ask your other question around 10 percent then Mm -hmm. Staff may have commented that it would be a resourcing and funding issue, um, but of course we wouldn't do that now. Uh, thank you for that response. Um, Councillor Stratford. Um, thanks everyone that, that have asked all my questions, but this one, how, how is a road, how is, how is an unsealed road categorised as an arterial or other? type of road and and are you taking into consideration roads that are being used as diversions at the moment okay through the chair um what we're looking at there is is um the the type of use that road has the the adt the traffic volumes um and and really when we when we assign or understand those uh, aspects for our unsealed network and try and align that with the onrc uh, we're not even close to um, hitting uh, the arterial 
um, uh, classification. Um, in fact, uh, not many of our our sealed roads actually uh, hit that one either. Um, so that shows the 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 high level um, around that 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 particular classification. Um, as far as the the detour routes, um, the classification on those those routes have not changed. Uh, but we can look at other um, you know options in the in the interim whether we um, whether we increase the uh, inspection timeframes on those uh, for a short duration um, to better manage the um, the resilience of those routes. And also to protect the lives of people having to drive on those roads while the Mangamukas and you know other roads are closed. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just, Thank you. Just for clarity, I think it's worth noting that the the criteria that assesses the roading hierarchy through the one net network road, one network road classification has been set by Waka Kotahi, not by council. So it is a nationally set um, guidelines and criteria for classifying roads and um, uh, and so that it allows Waka Kotahi and to compare levels of service and maintenance condition across um, across the country. So it's not a council. It's not a council mm. classification. I think at the risk of having a point of order called on me, we're not the same as the rest of the country. <laughs> so through 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 the chair, I'll just also address Councillor Stratford's um, um, point regarding um, road user safety on those diversion routes. Um, so one of the requirements where we have known slips and we have temporary traffic management in place is those sites are monitored daily. Um, so we are, our contractors are doing daily checks on those sites. Um, we are having significant issues with um, tampering, for lack of a better word, of the site protection. Um, and Ben is working with Fulton Hogan at the moment about where appropriate and where supply chain allows getting some more permanency around some of those um, signage and um, hit sticks rather than cones um, and the lights being installed. Um, the other thing is we have earlier this year initiated what we've called our top 10 roads initiative, um, which is um, where we've highlighted the 10 um, most frequent issues based roads um, in the unfilled space where one of our inspectors is assigned to actually um, on a fortnightly cycle, cycle um, offset from the contractor's fortnightly cycle, drive those roads as well. So how that works is um, the contractor will do their inspection on week zero, our um, area supervisor will drive through on week one and validate their inspection. They will have by end of week two have um, done all their um, routine work responses. At the end of week three, our inspector drives through and validates that those have been done and identifies any new defects and then we start again at week four zero um, where the contractor inspects. Um, so um, we've got in roads highlighted where that um, is happening on a regular basis with photos also being taken. Um, the other thing that Bernard yesterday actually rolled out with his team is a, um, a, a data photo capture tool called Mapillary. Um, we are using a standard phone mounted on the dash cam. You drive alone, uh, drive along the road. It takes um, photos every two seconds, isn't it, Bernard? Yep. Um, yep. And that's stored in the cloud, um, very much like Google um, Google Maps or Street View. Um, and we can then go back and see our latest um, data on that road. Um, um, the beauty of that is it's a public forum as well. So if anyone else drives along and takes photos of that road, um, we can use that as a reference point too. Um, so um, so we've just actually rolled that out with all our area supervisors and network supervisors um, yesterday. Okay. Um, so we're ha starting to build up that trend. That also helps us from responding to RFSs as well. We can see how quickly these roads are degrading and, and whether um, some of the comments are um, in terms of contractor performance, whether they they have actually been addressing them the way we expect them to. Great, thanks, Kelvin. That's great news. Thank you, thanks, Kevin. Um, so my question uh, was about the existing contracts um, and 
Uh, I agree with our general manager and Mr. Finch that the roading funding model across New Zealand for roading is broken. Uh, and for areas like ours, we, we do miss out um, because we've got such a large network and so few rate payers. So we really depend on that funding. Uh, our current contract uh, includes, uh, it is part of the lump sum payment. And I agree with Councillor Collard that, um, that the works aren't being done that are in the contract, like the clearing of the culverts within two metres of, of the culvert ends and the timeliness of that, getting that done before winter. Uh, and as a priority in areas that are on a hill, um, because um, there's and making sure that the water is actually going into the culvert instead of cross wall across the road, which creates slips. Uh, and the other part of the contract, which I don't think has been done, is the vegetation clearance. Uh, so it's really ad hoc, and I think having as part of the lump sum uh, aspect is is the part that doesn't make people accountable because we're only doing it as ten percent of the network. Um, so can the staff respond about changing the contract so that uh, basically the payments aren't made unless the work is done because cu uh, currently from what I'm hearing from ratepayers it's not being done and uh, further to that there was a, um, a motion that was done about drainage works uh, over and above uh, I think in my first term I think it was a million dollars of additional drainage works unsubsidised I think as a council, we need to think about how we spend our money uh, and prioritising drainage. So um, if there are any comments around those. Uh, through the chair, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll respond to your um, initial question around the, the inclusion of uh, yeah, additional lump sum activities. Um, at this stage, uh, we've had indications. So the contract model at the moment, it's a four plus two plus one plus one. So we could roll it over for a further plus one plus one, pushing us out four years. Um, we've had um, a bit of initial feedback from our contractors that um, due to escalating um, costs uh, on materials and the likes, uh, they may not be uh, interested in further rollovers. So. We are in a position now where we need to look at what that contract model looks like um, and getting a contract model in place to roll out the door uh, within the two year period. Uh, now, what that looks like um, at this stage, it's um, it, it's very early days. Uh, part of that process will be uh, communicating um, and, and understanding from our councils uh, what they're wanting to see. Uh, part of that process will be um, looking at the gu we'll be looking at the guidance out of Wakakotahi around the ONRF uh, uh, rollout and in the likes, um, and trying to align uh, the level of service expectations in our contracts uh, to that um, uh, nationally set uh, level of service expectation. So it's um, unfortunate I can't respond um, directly to the inclusion or exclusion of activities as lump sums at this point, but. Um, all options will be explored. Thank you, Bernard. I was just looking and seeing if Calvin or Andy were going to say anything um, before we proceed to the vote. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add one last, two last points actually. One was regarding um, your comment regarding drainage. So, as a result of that paper that we brought to council and the escalation impacts, the uh, the asset management team are presently looking at um, alternate options for how we can most effectively use the funding that we have available. Um, and we are putting all options on the table on, on that one in terms of um, revisiting steel extension unsubsidised funding um, and um, whether we prioritise drainage over or the likes over rehabilitation. Um, but noting that whatever decision there is a trade-off, um, so that's that's something we're looking at at the moment. The other point I just wanted to raise, and um, I see Councillor Smith has made a little note of it, that um, um, if we can take two minutes to quickly run you through the damage of the of the that we're seeing out there, um, yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll um, get Bernard. Bernard, you may not have seen Councillor Foy's um, <laughs> very, no. very strong indication of two minutes. So, <laughs> so I've taken ten seconds, and I'll leave you to it. Right. 
right. Am I still sharing my screen? No. No. Apologies. You'll see my calendar for a moment. Okie dokie. So I just uh, I pulled this one together this morning. Um, so it, it may be a bit clunky. Um, really just wanted to highlight the extent of damage uh, we've experienced uh, between the July and August um, events. Um, to put into perspective, the, the two events in July, uh, we're looking at around uh, one and a half million dollars in, in damages. Uh, when you compare that to the August event, uh, we're sitting up around uh, uh, 4.9 million dollars, so we're six and a half million thereabouts um, uh, across the two events. Just throwing up a few uh, photos there. So we're seeing a lot of the uh, the the dropout uh, type uh, slips. Uh, in fact, uh, all my photos I'm sharing today are, are your dropout uh, slips. Um, these are slips below the uh, the road pavement, uh, generally with the the toe of movement uh, in in private land or or uh, within a fairly restricted. Um, portion of the road corridor. Um, you'll see uh, the Iwitawa road there, uh, an example, um, a lot of the toes sit within um, active water, uh, waterways and water systems. Um, so that adds uh, increased um, risk uh, to those slips of, of uh, further um, deterioration. Um, I'll just quickly flip through these so you can get a um, a good uh, understanding of the extent um, impacting both unsealed and sealed uh, road network, uh, particularly in the uh, the North Hokianga uh, area with that same geology um, uh, sort of system that sits uh, across the right across the Mangamuka. Neil, I guess uh, there's been a lot of um, interest uh, in particular on our West Coast Road uh, slips, um, hopefully not overshadowing the, the wider extent of damages across the network, um, but those two in particular um, have been point of focus, um, mainly because um, of the, the uh, risks of further movement on those slips um, and the uh, the real challenges around um, ability for us to actually um, get in there, open those uh, roads up um, through immediate response. Um, they, as I mentioned, they do have um, fairly significant uh, uh, issues um, outside of just what you see from, from the road surface. Um, if I use the West Coast Road Pangaroo site as an example, uh, we would ordinarily come along to a, a slip like that and try and retreat the road, so shift the road away from the slip. Um, as you can see by the uh, topography um, image there, um, that slip actually sits as part of a much larger uh, slip um, uh, movement, um, both below and above the road there. So. Um, Feedback, we, we rely, generally through these events, we rely very heavily on the expert advice of, of geotechnical engineers um, who will go out and assess these, these slips and give us options. Um, their advice on that particular slip there is if we retreat, uh, we will be overloading uh, the slip um, and we will uh, activate a much larger slip movement. Um, so you can see that uh, we, a little bit stuck between a, uh, a rock and a hard place um, on these ones. So uh, temporary works are underway uh, to try and maintain the carriageways we have as further investigations, test pitting, um, uh, borehole uh, testing and the likes is undertaken to try and determine uh, our best approach. The West Coast Road, um, our, our closure site, um, I'll just highlight that one for you. We have done some temporary ramping works there. Um, and we've been monitoring that one for movement. Um, we do want to try and get that one open to light vehicles uh, as soon as we can, because we understand the detour around uh, 
uh, you know, Bruna Runa uh, is not ideal um, at all for the, for the locals in that catchment. Um, but the slip is still moving. Um, we're concerned about putting any heavy, um, any heavy traffic over that. Uh, we may have to restrict it to light vehicles. Uh, we need to understand the risk around that. How can we, you know, how do we control light vehicles? Um, uh, and uh, how do we uh, ensure that in the middle of the night um, that, that slip doesn't go um, and is, is remains visible? Um, so part of that process, we are looking at, um, at the weather forecast um, at the moment coming out of the Met Service. Um, we're looking at a, a possibly an additional 70 mil over that site uh, this Saturday. Um, so whether we open it up to light traffic beforehand or not um, is still up uh, for debate. Uh, and then if we look at the long-term uh, forecast, the Met Service are indicating we may actually receive another uh, ex-tropical cyclone uh, in approximately two weeks' time. So real risk around that one. Um, so hopefully that gives you a bit of a appreciation of uh, the extent of damages out there um, and, uh, and the work required around those. Um, just to confirm, we've still got... I know I'm eating into time. Uh, just to confirm, we've still got um, uh, three uh, full-time slip clearing crews uh, out on that west coast area. We've got an additional two out on the east um, uh, eastern side of the state highway there. Uh, we've got four greater crews uh, running around that particular catchment as well at the moment, um, as well as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, our T8 uh, subcontractor is looking at uh, increasing and improving those traffic management needs as well. So there's heaps of work, um, heaps of work underway up there, and uh, looks like we're going to be continuing uh, along this trend for at least a further three weeks. Thank you, Bernard, and for your presentation. Um, I'll be doing a site visit to um, those roads today, so I look forward to seeing those crews. Um, so we'll bring up the vote. Uh, it's just an information report. I'm in favour. In favour. Councillor Smith. Support. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Councillor Busich. Aye. Aye. Member Gardner. Aye. Member Tahiri. Aye. Kapai, thank you. Aye. Uh, so that, <laughs> we did hear you, Councillor Busich. I just, so, I just uh, have trouble turning my mic back on. Sorry. Not a problem. So uh, we'll move on to item 5.2, uh, Three Waters Reform. And uh, I can see that this is an information uh, report as well. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the staff will speak to this. Um, so um, I've got a mover from Councillor Stratford. Do I have a seconder? Second, Abe Collard. Thank you, Councillor Collard. Uh, uh, to Andy, would you like to speak to this item? And um, or Thank do you, you have a staff member? Thank no, you. I'll, I'll speak to this, this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a, a relatively straightforward item, hopefully. Um, it's basically just giving elected members the, uh, some information regarding council applying for uh, Three Waters Reform Transition support funding. And so that is effectively not for projects. It's for potentially allowing staff to work on uh, Three Waters trans, tra um, transition activities and allowing backfilling or other ways of keeping business as usual going. Uh, so it is a 800,000 package as tranche one. There will be further funding coming forward. But as it's for backfilling staff, it was just an information item for elected members and the infrastructure committee that uh, we will apply for this funding. Um, it will have an impact on BAU because consultants uh, are not the same as staff, but at least uh, helps mitigate the impacts of work that will be required and potentially mandated by the DAA to uh, assist in transition activities up to 2024. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Finch, and um, thank you for bringing this paper to keep us informed. I can see that Member Tahiri has 
a partai, a question, and uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, kia ora, through the chair. Um, I am aware a little bit around this uh, kaupapa, especially around Trent 1. Now, I um, send my reservations to um, Blair around um, the the engagement, really, because um, to, with the um, better off funding, the Crown is quite clear in stipulating the engagement that needs to take place with local iwi and hapu, I'm of the view that that hasn't taken place nor been given the right justification around um, engaging on with hapu and iwi around it. I know um, a lot of iwi have voiced their concerns to Blair. Um, and I take note, Andy, that um, it's not projects, rather though the Crown still says that um, we need to be engaged on how, how any funding is spent. Um, whether it's projects or not. So uh, my question is, um, uh, well, well, actually my statement is, is that I, I'm, I'm not inclined to support this based on that, the fact that I know there hasn't been proper consultation or actually we're not observing the, uh, the stipulations from the Crown for this funding. Um, so I'm just, it's really just a comment because I'm actually fine trying to find a question, but I, I also note that um, this is only one part and it's behind the, the um, capacity for staff, but um, when is the the other, well, actually, Blair in an email sent to me said that this, this, this was not going to take forward because they had an extension um, from DIA till the 31st of December. So where is it actually at, Andy? Um, is this going yeah. to... Proceed or so, so, so through the chair. Look, I, I um, acknowledge the comments. I think um, there is confusion um, around the various funding packages that have been announced by the DIA and uh, money. You uh, commented around the better off funding package that was announced for the, the DIA and tranche one that we've been working with for um, a period of time, identifying projects, and we've recently got an extension to uh, the deadline for submission to the end of December and our Tihono unit is working across now, working across identifying a methodology to consult with the 11 iwi and 250 odd hapu across our region is how we can work to identify uh, the wishes of iwi and hapu around projects for the 8 million of funding uh, for tranche one and and clearly the issue there is the there's going to be a significant number of projects that will clearly exceed uh, tranche one and tranche two better off funding so that's a, a future conversation this this activity is just effectively what I'm seeking the information report is uh, the information report here is just for a grant from the DIA NTU to of eight hundred thousand for uh, staff to be backfilled while they're working on transition activities. It's not something that the DIA uh, request or expect consultation around. It's just a a backfilling sum of money um, into council to allow council to actually actively work on transition activities is not project related. So the two, the two, the two packages I think are confusing, um, but this is certainly just a grant that we can apply for. If we don't apply for it, we don't get it. We'll still be expected to undertake the work. So it'll be, um, uh, it wouldn't be helpful if we, we didn't apply for it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Finch. Um, Yes, and Member Tahid is correct that there is a separate fund, the Better Off Fund. This is yep. purely towards the technical um, professionals in order to help the transition. Um, the Better Off funding will come in a separate paper, um, probably to the full council meeting. And uh, thank you to Councillor Smith for identifying uh, that extension of time in our last meeting um, that was available. Uh, so Councillor Smith is up next. 
Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Andy. Thank you for this report. Um, I guess on the back of the last one of DIA funding and the continuous question that I asked as to whether or not we were meeting the targets, my learning from this term is that when money falls from the sky in the way that it has, we need to make sure that we're having continuous governance oversight of that. So, Madam Chair, my question is not a question. It's more a comment or observation that perhaps it would be useful for the incoming council to ensure that they establish some mechanism to have oversight of external funding as a principle. I note that Kaipara District Council do this. They receive a report on a, a bi-monthly basis, I believe, that summarises all external funding uh, and how they are just keeping that governance oversight of it, just to give assurance that we're meeting targets. Uh, I hear where Member Tahiri is coming from. Um, there is, is absolutely that concern and perhaps just to reiterate uh, and to try and give a little bit more confidence uh, this, this is purely just some money that we can put into our into our kitty, acknowledging that our staff have got a significant workload on them going through the transition that we need to go through. Uh, but we do need to do better in the space of the better off fund uh, and the way that we have that corridor. So I'm looking forward to that in the coming weeks. But an observation, Madam Chair, not seeking an amendment or a note, uh, just hoping that somebody online will pick up that we need to have better governance oversight of externally funded uh, external funding going forward. Kia ora. Uh, kia ora, Councillor Smith. Uh, thank you for that. I'll now proceed to the vote. Um, I think it's quite a straightforward paper there from our staff. Thank you for keeping us informed. Uh, so I'm in favour. Support. Councillor Collar, Councillor Smith. Support. Councillor Stratford. Aye. Council of Usage. Aye. And I'm pleased we got that funding. Thank you. Uh, Member Gardner. Support. And Member Tahere. Uh, Tautoko. Uh, thank you. That brings us to our last agenda item, which is uh, 5.3, just an update for our last infrastructure committee uh, meeting. Happy to uh, move. Thank you, Councillor Smith, and uh, seconder. Second, if you like. I think Councillor Vucic was the second there, and I can't see, I'll just see any hands. I don't think there's anything in particular. Um, right. I've got Rachel's uh, Councillor have... Smith. Right. Kia ora, Madam Chair. Just a really quick comment. Yesterday in the Strategy and Policy Committee meeting, we identified that there's an action on the action sheet that we recommended to the Infrastructure Committee. So I know that logistically it's very hard, but it would be great to see items of that nature transfer to the committee where it's relevant uh, so that we're not having to track it outside of that. So just a, a note on that one, that it would be good to see that come through at, at the right committee going forward. Uh, thank you, Councillor Smith. And um, I don't see any other hands raised. I think it's quite straightforward. Uh, it'll be interesting to see in the new uh, training and what the committee structures might look like and if there might be a change up with those. Um, so on that note, I'll bring that to the vote. Uh, so I'm in favour. In favour. Councillor Smith. Uh, Councillor Stratford. Aye. Uh, Councillor Busich. Aye. Member Gardner. Aye. And Member Tahere. Aye. Great, Kapai, thank you. Uh, Namahi nui uh, kia koto, and thank you for our last meeting. Uh, so that brings us to the end, and well done on your experience and getting all of that information and sharing around the question time. Uh, and I, I thank Member Tahere for his. Uh, his contribution today. I can't see your face, but um, I'm sure that we may meet uh, Kanohi Kite Kanohi one day soon. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll have to see what the election brings to who might be around uh, the table. Um, so, uh, Councillor oh. Foyer, on behalf of the, the infrastructure team, can I thank you personally for your chairing of this committee. Um, we've had some challenging conversations as we've gone through it. It's been good, it's been um, uh, interesting, it's moved the far north forward. So on behalf of the whole infrastructure team, please accept my thanks for your chairman, cha chair ladyship. Um, and 
and uh, we'll see where we go from here. Thank you very much um, to our general manager, Mr. Finch, and to our other general manager, um, Calvin Thomas from the NTA. Um, I'll be doing some site visits now out to those roads that were discussed today. So uh, I'm sure I'll see that uh, firsthand. Uh, we can now conclude our meeting uh, with a karakia and uh, I might extend that gratitude to Councillor Smith there. I can see. Um, Thank you very much. Ki hora te marino, ki whakapapa paunamu te moana, hei horahi mā tātou i te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tātou i tātou katoa. Hui e tai. Kia pai tōra.